down and jump to sly kick, press jump again to bolt, then press left because Richter turns around when doing a sly kick hop. Uppercut and drift forward. In the air, press up, followed by quarter circle forward and attack. After a slight delay, do it again. Up, then down and jump to slide kick while initiating a blade dash. Drop off the ledge and finish the blade dash input with quarter circle forward attack. Finally, three slide kicks and a bolt to meet the man himself. Get to 33 hearts and hit it, god. Throw a holy water down to activate damage stacking, which makes our hydro storm do significantly more damage. Bless the rains down in Transylvania again, and pray to R and Jesus for good luck because damage stacks do random damage. That's prologue. Hope you like it, since you'll see a lot of it due to poor damage stacks killing runs. Heyo boyos and welcome to Speedrun Review, a series in which I learn a new speedrun then explain the run and how it works so I can rate it and discuss whether I think it's worth it for you to play or not. We are now in control of Alucard, who has a completely different moveset from Richter, who we played in the prologue. Unlike the Vampire Hunter, our half-vampire friend here does not have all his skills unlocked yet, so we need to explore Dracula's castle and gather the essential ones to finish the game. Backdashing and bringing out our shield ends the animation early, allowing us to backdash again instantly. This is called shield dashing, and it's the fastest form of movement we have access to. Shield dashing is about twice as fast as walking. Mashing back dash and shield like a man possessed, Algar can quickly approach his enemies. Landing while performing an air attack cancels the rest of the animation, resulting in a much faster recovery time. Doing a small turnaround hop and slashing monsters is often the most time efficient way to defeat the obstacles blocking our path. Not even 5 steps inside, we already do something unusual. Well, aside from us moonwalking everywhere. Alucard strips down and jumps straight into this war. There is a method to our madness. Here, it's the big toss. If a single hit does more than half your max HP, it sends you flying backwards at high speeds until you hit a ceiling or wall. Coming into contact with the wargs does 14 damage to an unarmored Alucard. Mathematicians in the audience might realize an issue here. 14 is nowhere close to half our 80 starting HP. So we need to get weaker. Much weaker. Naming your save file specific sequences activates cheat codes. We find a stroke of luck in, well, luck mode. Entering this code for the file name maximizes Alucard's starting luck stat at the cost of lowering all his others substantially. Most importantly, our starting HP becomes 25, satisfying the conditions to get a big toss off wards. Fortunately, our lower base defense stat lets us keep the Dragon Helm on and still take 14 damage, which is nice because it halves monsters defense while equipped. Pulling out the shield after falling long distances cancels the fall impact, letting us get up just a little quicker. Here we go the faster secret route to save time and pick up a healing item. Now we set up another big toss. Get close to the war causing it to start attacking, then eat the plot post to heal so we can take a second hit greater than half our max HP because math. Finally, jump over the attack and backdash into their butt. This perfectly lines us up to fly straight through the room where death usually steals Alucard's starting items, letting us keep his overstatus starting gear. The Alucard Sword makes quick work of everything we come across. Movement is by far the most important aspect of speedrunning Soten. Properly timing turnaround jump slashes along with jumping just high enough to clear gaps and reach platforms, then squeezing in back dashes whenever possible and shield dashing everywhere else separates great and mediocre runs. Luckily, Soten's movement is super fun. Alchemy Lab is straightforward. Platform your way to the bosses while managing random enemy patterns. Logora and Gaibon work together in a formidable duo boss fight, and they're dead. Alucard's sword and dragon hell make most bosses glorify normal enemies. The goal here is to finish them off on the same frame to avoid getting the level up fanfare twice. They both take 5 hits to kill, but we need to hit Slogara once at the beginning of the fight to trigger Gaibon picking them up. Jump after both of them and slash so Slogara gets hit once and Gaibon twice. Then as you fall, attack again to hit both of them twice, which staggers Gaibon making them fall to the ground. A final ground of slash gets the double kill. There's a lot of things that can happen here, especially when random crits are factored in, but with enough practice we can react and still have a quick fight even if a double kill is impossible. After the boss is a few simple rooms we navigate without much trouble.
We men are absolute bastards that do whatever the f they want, and we just have to deal with it. A short hop down slash covers most options, but we may still need to react to what they do. Wait a minute. Skipping cutscenes in Soten requires a clear file on your memory card. Without it, they are unskippable, and this run doesn't work at all for another reason down the line. Getting one is easy enough, just beat the game with a true ending one time, and you're ready to go. Right now, we are working our way towards Outer Wall to pick up the Soul of Wolf Relic, which lets Alucard transform into a wolf. You wouldn't expect it, but this wolf has some insane vertical. We need wolf form to reach the area behind this statue. The statue slides in or out of the wall every minute. During odd minutes, it blocks the path, while for even ones, it moves out of the way. This cycle means we must keep a good pace on our way to the relic to avoid returning too late, forcing us to sit and wait while Alucard twiddles his thumbs. The in-game timer that controls the statue starts at the beginning of prologue and is shockingly accurate to real time, even with all the loading and lag. Everything from the start of the run to when we enter the obscured pathway is a race to keep the correct clock cycle. This section of the speedrun is understandably referred to as the clock rush. Between the clock room and outer wall are some windy rooms and this extremely long flat one that tests your thumb shield dashing endurance. It takes some practice to slash your sword at the fastest speed while also finding the right rhythm for shield dashing and alternating between them. Once Alucard makes it outside, we head up to hit a switch that activates the elevator our goal is locked behind. Of course, it can't be that simple. First, we fight ourselves. Okay, it's not actually that easy. That's just what it looks like when you get lucky. Doppelganger loves to read your inputs and strike back slightly faster than you can hit him, along with dodging attacks. But when you score the first hit, he gets knocked down onto the ground and it's possible to hit him as he gets up. Loop this twice and he's already dead. The best way to do this fight is to slash at him as soon as the fight starts and hope it hits. And if you get really lucky, this can happen. What the f Once he's dead, dash up the stairs to the switch while crossing your fingers that Medusa heads don't spawn in the wrong places. Then slash the lever three times. The elevator starts at the bottom of this section, but if we go through this door at the top and re-enter, the elevator warps to the top, allowing us to walk in and grab our relic. Now that Alucard has claimed his persona, we take the lift down and start backtracking to the clock room. On the way, we grab a garnet utilizing a quirk of how wolf form works. When you jump while running upstairs as wolf Alucard, the game gives you a bunch of extra height so you don't just slam into the stairs. If we turn after jumping, we can redirect this extra momentum to make unintended jumps, like the one to this ledge with the garnet inside the pot. Running in a wolf form is slightly slower than shield dashing on flat or complicated terrain, but the rooms from here to our destination happen to be just bumpy and simple enough to make wolf faster. While running at full speed, the wolf can't bark on the ground, so we need to jump or run off a slope to attack. If we run off a ledge at full speed, Alucard can't turn around until he makes contact with the floor again, so we have to slow down slightly before going off to turn in the air. To get behind the statue, we use an odd interaction that happens when you exit a transformation in the air. For some reason, this resets our jump state and the game thinks we haven't jumped yet. Sadly, we aren't able to double jump, but we can dive kick, something you aren't intended to do without access to a second jump, since you need to be in the air with a jump still available. Dive kicking the candle gives just enough height to make it behind the statue. Knowing all these little quirks and mixing them together to create seamless movement is where this game's at its best. Soten is very hard to speedrun, but it only gets more fun the better you get at it. Skeleton Blade Masters react to what Alucard does, we use this to manipulate their AI to do what we want. There's a library card on the ground here, which we'll use in a second. First, let's fight Minotaur and Werewolf, who guard the relic. Maybe this boss fight will be hard. Fuck! 
The most dangerous part of this fight is shield dashing close to Minotaur, because if you get too close we'll come in contact and take damage. Getting close causes Minotaur to step backwards. He doesn't attack while backstepping so we kill him before he can even make a single attack. Werewolf, well, at least he showed up I guess. Gotta be there for your boys. Next we avoid accidentally opening up the floor and grab Form of Mist. Using the library card we picked up conveniently just before this boss warps us right in front of the shop located in Long Library. It is paramount that we don't enter the shop yet. If we do, the run is over. All transformations can be cancelled into a different transformation. Going from one transformation to another is faster than transforming into them from human form, except for Mist. So it's fastest for us to go into Mist then our preferred form as opposed to going straight into the one we want. For Wolf, this is called a Miss Wolf. Backdash off the ledge, turn around and Miss Wolf, then run right and use a combination of the wolf stair jump, miss to solve for time, and a detransformation dive kick off this book to pick up fairy card, a relic used to summon the fairy familiar. We pick her up because she talks a lot. Entering the shop as she's talking lets us pull up the pause menu during the cutscene that plays when we enter for the first time. When the menu is open like this, it breaks the shop as long as we stay in this room. We can now open the menu whenever we want. If we go to the Sell Items tab and open the inventory to equip our garnet, the game allows us to sell one garnet even though we now have zero in our unequipped inventory. Zero minus one is negative one, but in computer math, it underflows and becomes the maximum value storable in allocated memory, resulting in us now having 255 garnets, which is about as much as the average Yu-Gi-Oh deck. Exit out of the Sell Items tab and re-enter to update it, then sell at least 104 garnets to make all the money we need for our shopping spree. Buy a Mana Prism, two Buffalo Stars, and a Duplicator. This is is the second reason we need to have a clear file before speedrunning, as without it there will not be a duplicator in the shop. Arguably the best item in the game, the duplicator allows Alucard to use consumable items infinite times. Mana prisons can be consumed to restore all your magic, while buffalo stars are a throwing weapon that do high damage with a quick animation. A duplicator gives us unlimited access to these powerful items. Conveniently, throwing buffalo stars also resets the backdash animation so we can shield dash with them. With this loadout, we can fly through the rest of the game. Metaphorically, not literally. To do that, we need to pick up the Soul of Bat first. Getting where we need to go, we have another stair jump. Mana Prisms also give you invincibility while they're activating, meaning we can walk through enemies. For the next room, we want to run into it at full speed as wolf, since with the right pattern, a flea armor will big toss us all the way through. Shield dash down the stairs and Mana Prism through the flea armor and fight lesser demon. I would complain that this boss dies to like 4 buffalo stars, but technically as far as the game is considered, they aren't a boss, since they're not in the boss catalog in the shop. As soon as they die, transform into wolf, bark, then run to set up the proper timing for leaving the non-boss room. Run for a little bit, then do a momentum jump by high jumping with up plus jump and immediately shifting to up forward, preventing the wolf from slowing down midair. Miss through the metal bars and acquire soul of bat. Here there are two slight routing deviations. The advanced option is to fly out the way we came and position ourselves at the bottom of these stairs. We then press against this wall and miss Wolf with slightly staggered timing into the corner. This causes Wolf Alucard to enter the transformation already running full speed. With excellent timing and positioning, it's possible to jump and de-transform such that the game miscalculates Alucard's position and places him inside the staircase. You can pause the game to confirm your timings as you do the trick, but for this to matter you need to be able to pause and unpause the game quickly enough for only one frame to pass in between pauses. Both the jump and reverting to human form only have a one frame window, so if you miss it while pause buffering you have to try the whole trick again. Once in the floor, dive kick to get pushed all the way to the bottom of the screen, then fly to outer wall while under the map. For this route to save time you need to get the trick within a few attempts and the majority of runners aren't capable of pulling this off consistently. For everyone else we warp back to the library with a second library card. Astute viewers may have noticed that I bought an extra item in the shop. That was the library card we use here. Let's talk about Alucard's most nimble form. As a bat he gains the ability to fly. Pressing any direction will cause us to slowly flap around. Going in diagonal direction directions is noticeably slower than orthogonal ones, so whenever possible we should avoid diagonal movement when free flying. You might be thinking, this is pretty slow. 
it is. But the secret is to go even slower. Holding jump while free flying locks Bat Alucard in place. If we do a three quarter circle input and let go of jump, Alucard performs the wing smash spell, sending him soaring forward. While in a wing smash, we can fly right through enemies while also doing damage. Alucard can adjust his trajectory up and down as he flies, allowing us to traverse hazard filled rooms with great difficulty. Why is controlling the wing smash so hard? It's just pushing up and down to steer, right? Well, yes, but actually no. If done normally, a wing smash only lasts a little more than a second, before booting Alucard back into human form. To extend the duration, we have to input a second wing smash. But holding jump only locks our movement when we are flying around normally. During a wing smash, we retain full control while jump is held, so spinning our finger around the d-pad for the spell causes the bat to wobble up and down. To keep a wing smash chain going, we must cast a new wing smash within 63 frames of the previous one. This results in most of our flight time being taken up by re-inputting wing smashes, giving us only a small window to steer. If we want to move upwards, it's best to do a full circle and then release jump when we return to up. If flying down is what we desire, perform a standard wing smash until we reach forward, then drop to down forward and let go of jump. Doing it like this will ensure that we start flying in the preferred direction on the very first frame of the wing smash. Going straight forward is not as simple as just doing a wing smash and ending on forward. Since every wing smash is started by tapping up, and only then sweeping through back, down, and forward, wing smash chains will naturally list upwards, as human fingers will often spend a few frames longer pressing up than any direction. Fixing this requires some counter steering. Do the standard input then briefly tap down to even out when needed, but don't take too long or else the chain will end, or you will overcorrect and go downward instead. This is just a brief primer on wing smash movement, but it should give you a picture on how hard it actually is. We also saw how tricky inputs can be in the prologue with Richter. Execution is a large part of playing Soten. If you want to pick up this game, expect to spend many hours practicing shield dashing, blade dashing, and wing smash chains, not even including actually steering the bat while doing it. Alright, back to the run. Mana prism and perform a bat dash by back dashing, then transforming into bat, which preserves the momentum during the transformation. Wing smash twice and go through the loading zone. Do one wing smash. Keep in mind that loading zones will eat your inputs. In the next room, wing smash up and fly over the hump. Then wing smash down until the turn. Here we refresh our magic. Finally, wing smash down through the rest of the room. Going into mist instantly cancels a wing smash and overrides our momentum, allowing us to turn on a dime or make emergency stops. Now in the CD room, bat dash and wing smash to clear them as fast as we can without leap stone. From here, Wing Smash and Dude Transform on the stairs to end up in the elevator. Take it up, Shield Dash and jump to the door, then hop around the ceiling and transform. Zigzag with Miss Bats for the rest. Make sure to fly high enough for this one or else you'll bonk, and with the Mana Prism for the CD door. In the next section, Bat Dash and Wing Smash up until the candles go off the bottom of the screen, and then smash forward. End with a downward one and miss bat. Smash once, then hold down afterward. This sets us up to bunk on the cog and fall down quickly. Backdash off the ledge to dodge the harpy and drop through the platforms. Walk off the last platform and backdash into the next room. Make a tiny hop onto this cog and jump up to this point. Then jump and bat to fly up. Wait for the harpy to spin to time the damage boost off of her. Immediately jump and mana prism upon landing. Make sure to normally transform into bat here as miss batting will get you killed. Line up with this platform, wing smash up, miss bat, wing smash down, miss bat, wing smash twice and revert to human form. Mana prism, backdash, then bat dash, fly down a tiny bit, wing smash up, miss bat, brush against this wall for sub pixel positioning. If you don't, you'll occasionally bonk on the next room transition. Wing smash, then tap down, loading transition, chain one more wing smash, then miss bat at the top of the stairs. Smash down and let it play out. Thavka can chuck some stars. Wait, there was a boss in this room? Jump when the fire starts to get the proper timing for the CD door unlocking. Don't mana prism here because it will lock the game more than it already does. After CD, jump prism, bat fly straight up. Once you clear the floor, smash up once without chaining, then throw a star at this block to break it, setting up for Richter skip. Just a few steps ahead, Richter is waiting for us. He plans on fighting Alucard because plot, and I don't know, we've been skipping the cutscenes. What actually matters to us is that he only squares up to fight if you pass through this invisible box right here. Notice how there's a little gap between the ceiling and the top of the trigger zone. We are going to cram our furry bodies right in. As Wolf, if you start to run and jump on the same frame, you do the walking jump with a running momentum. This jump has the perfect trajectory to clear the trigger zone if you line up with both your front paws on the top step like this and break the block. Get into position and press forward, then forward and jump at the same time. Once you get the jump, which is easy to tell because it looks very different, miss bat and wing smash forward three times. When you skip the trigger at the entrance, the game uses the default state for this room. By some sheer stroke of luck, that's a state right after the Richter boss fight when it's been beaten with a good ending. 
To get the real ending without this, we would have to grab the holy glasses, and for that we need the gold and silver rings, which are hidden in the castle. Meaning that avoiding this trigger does far more than skip one easy boss. Fly through the room and skip the cutscene for defeating Richter either instantly or after the wing smash starts ending. If we do it at the wrong time, Alucard will fly past the section of ground where he normally jumps in the cutscene, and will walk into the wall forever while we don't have control. Skipping the cutscene warps us to the position where Alucard starts walking, so we either want to minimize the warp backwards and let the wing smash thud the needle, or use it to fix bad positioning. On to the inverted castle. We already have everything we need, so all there is for us to do is wing smash chain our way to Dracula. I think I have already made my point on how challenging wing smash chains can be, and in the second castle, it's even more important that we hit them. Because Alucard falls helplessly for a second or two after ending a wing smash, we can accidentally land on enemies if we mess up. The punishment for this is often death in the inverted castle, since monsters are so much stronger here. And and we have very low health from luck mode, skipping HP ups, plus zero defense from duplicator along with wearing no armor. It's even possible for us to get one shot later on. This room with the tombstones is especially dangerous. We can't go over them because the train will boost us down if we go too high. Going through them will give us at least one level up which freezes the screen. If the screen freeze happens at a bad time and causes us to drop our chain, they might hit us. It's likely lethal. We can, however, fly above the enemies in the other rooms. This boss is going to be hard, I promise. Why do I even bother? Bat dash, turn human, dive kick, throw three stars, walk up throwing three more, then crouch and throw the rest. Medusa can't be hit for the first half a second because she needs to stop being a statue. Due to this, transforming loses no time if we can't hit her anyway. So crossing the threshold that starts the fight faster makes the fight quicker, even if doing it this way has some end lag. We are coming up on the most dangerous room in the run, the Angel Room. Angelic archers and demonic imps work in tandem hoping to block our ascent. If everything goes well, we simply wing smash and climb the scaffolding, then zigzag our way out. Getting hit at all or mispositioning a single wing smash will quickly spiral out of control as the demons will hold us in place for the angels to line up their shots. Using a mana prism for invincibility and importing the soul seal spell is our best hope of recovering. If we manage to get through in one piece, the inverted Colosseum awaits us. Maintaining a good wing smash chain is essential here. Keep an eye on the magic meter while chaining. Watching your mana is honestly one of the biggest tips for chaining wing smashes, as it's the fastest way to know if you've made a potentially lethal mistake. If it doesn't decrease when it should, it means we've missed a re-input and the chain will end soon. However, the scary part is almost over. There is only one more spot where Alucard could realistically die, unless we make a really stupid mistake. Wing smash then press down, followed by up and miss bat. Fly to the ceiling and wing smash up to get a terrain boost that won't bonk after the transition, position here and fly down against the ground, smash up again, and do a super late misbat. Zip on the inverted stairs here, make sure to fly slightly forward on the rightward facing stairs to avoid getting boosted into the ground. Now we are back in the clock room. Through those doors are the final two bosses. We are intended to go around the inverted castle and kill the OG Castlevania bosses to gather the five relics of Vlad to open them. But walls are an illusion to Alucard, and so are pants apparently. Don't fail the chain in this room, or you could get one shot. Smash upward at the end and boost into this room. Here we must fly against this wall to set our subpixel. We can smash and revert to move forward without altering our subpixel, as flying forward and backdashing does change it. Restore magic, then equip the second buffalo star in the main hand. Hand. Go to the top of the menu and put on the heart refresh we got all the way back in prologue for finishing with zero hearts. Equipping the stars first will allow us to switch back to them quickly when the time comes. For now, line this pixel of Alucard's hair up with a third striation on the pillar in the background. Walking does not change your subpixel, so don't worry. If everything has been done correctly, we are all set up for the skip. Press right, then attack as soon as possible without hitting them on the same frame. While the screen is frozen from offering our homies $20, hold backdash to buffer it. Freezing the screen at this specific location and backdashing causes the map to be shifted by a few pixels. The shift makes the loading zone here accidentally underflow our exposition when going through it because it was never designed to move. Entering a room with an underflowed exposition warps us to the opposite side of the room, in this case right inside a wall. As soon as we see the new room load, transform into a bat, in bat form we will fall into the ceiling of the room below. Here, wing smash chain 5 or 6 times, depending on how fast we naturally do them. If done correctly, Alucard will pop out after only 2 screen changes, and we've successfully done relic skip. Put on the buff 
Buffalo Star and Wing Smash. Start to hold up during the transition. Once inside the cage, transform into Wolf while still holding up to activate it. Two final Wing Smashes, then we're already at Shaft. Skip his dialogue and backdash three times, then change how you hold your controller. Place it on your lap and use your pointer and middle finger for the two attack buttons. Your other hand's pointer finger will press the jump button. We don't need to move for this fight, just jump and mash stars. The timing can be quite tricky, but jump right after he starts moving and throw stars for a quick kill. If you mess up, jump again and finish him off. Skip the next cutscene and fly to the top of the screen once you regain movement after the screen flash. Right before Dracula says the word form, turn human and start throwing stars. Jump once when we touch the ground, then put your thumb back on movement since we won't need to jump again. When Dracula jerks left, walk right. After a slight delay, walk left. Repeat for right. And time. Man, bosses in this game really aren't hard at all. The difficulty of speedrunning Soten really comes from navigating the castle swiftly. It's like 80% movement, 10% skips, 5% menuing, and 5% boss fights. Making mistakes in Soten generally only means losing a little time and attempting to skip again, or taking a suboptimal line through a room, though in luck mode sometimes they can be run ending. The library floor clip is the most difficult single trick, but it's not mandatory unless you play at top level. It saves maybe a minute or so if done first try, and you can do multiple tries. Don't get me wrong, you still need to spend a lot of time practicing it along with other difficult tricks, like wing smashing back and forth through rooms, or getting the slither and guy bond double kill. The chef quick kill also takes a little bit of getting used to. Relic Skip is surprisingly easy if you use the setup, and Richter Skip is pretty consistent once you get the feel for it. I'd say that the skill floor for running Soten is a little higher than most people would like, because Richter movement, getting consistent clock rush cycles, and wing smash chains do take considerable upfront investment. If I were to rate difficulty out of 5, a 4 is about right. By no means is it easy to get a good time, but there isn't anything unfair or unrealistic. Like all hard things, it just takes some time and practice. Once you get past the initial execution barrier, this game is great. Great. There's enough variety in movement and tricks to keep the run from feeling like a slog. You start off with Richter's high octane gameplay into shield dashing and big tossing with Alucard, then platforming through Alchemy Lab. When shield dashing starts to get stale, Wolf pops up. The menu for Shock Witch is also a brush of fresh air, along with Book Jump. Finally, Bat's dynamic mechanics close out the run. This isn't the type of speedrun where you do the same thing ad nauseum until the credits end your suffering. Alucard and your percent is also that perfect speedrun length, long enough to sink your teeth into and have weight, but it isn't a multi hour endurance test. For me, it's a four out of five and fun. But I suspect if I play more and really get kind of sick with it and start schmoozing through rooms, it'd become a five out of five. RNG does play a factor with stuff like enemy patterns and crits. Look at Flea Man or Medusa heads. Prologue is by far the worst defender of this. If you are willing to take up to 15 seconds of time loss, then the odds are like 70 to 80 percent. But if you want an optimal start, it's one in eight. This kind of sucks, but it takes like half a minute to know if you got lucky or not, so it's not terrible. The absolute nightmare scenario is that bad luck could cause you to miss your clock rush cycle, although there is some counterplay in this scenario. If you skip the garnet and instead get an onyx behind this wall after the clock rush, you can give yourself 5 to 7 more seconds to make the cycle. This does lose time overall due to taking longer to pick up and having a lower cell value, but the point is there's almost always something you can do to mitigate bad RNG in this game. There aren't any glitches that make the game hard to see or put a menu over gameplay that you have to manage while fighting enemies and running around. The strategies used are also realistic for humans, plus the base game is very solid. There isn't too much jank. Alucard controls smoothly, only complaint is lag, and that's fixed if you play on the Xbox Live Arcade version instead of the PSX version that I use. It's a 5 out of 5 for comfort. The run is a fan fantastic, and even if you aren't into speedrunning yourself, I recommend playing the game. Go mess around with stuff covered in this video, it's more than worth it. Do shop glitch, zoom around as a bat, or just enjoy Soden casually. Alucard any percent is truly a 9 out of 10 run, only losing points to hand pain, prologue resetting, and front loaded practice. It's near perfect. You'll also likely enjoy the first episode of speedrun review, which you can find here. I will see you dudes, dames, and doppelgangers later.